Welcome to launch day of our new 12-part series, Hamilton at War. It is an immersive, narrative history that follows Hamilton's life and military service from the Battle of White Plains through to the British surrender at Yorktown. There is much to be inspired by and learned from Hamilton's life. He was a larger-than-life founding father whose blueprint for America is the world we live in today. And now, Episode 1 of Hamilton at War. Prelude it is late fall 1776. George Washington's army on the retreat to New Jersey has narrowly escaped the clutches of British General Sir William Howe. After the American defeat at the Battle of White Plains, which many historians today consider a draw, Howe decided not to pursue the rebels. He instead waited for reinforcements. A fortuitous rainstorm further stalled action due to soaked flintlock muskets and the British army decided to return to Manhattan Island. At White Plains, Alexander Hamilton distinguished himself and his New York Provincial Artillery Company by fighting a delaying action that allowed the majority of his fellow patriots in arms to escape. His was an independent battery of just two field pieces, but already his ambitions were rumbling as he began to claw his way up the military hierarchy. This was a man who would not be held down long. And that is where we join our story. Hamilton at War. Written by Robert Child and narrated by James Gillis. Alexander Hamilton, 19, tall, almost frail looking, captain of the New York Provincial Artillery, marched beside his clattering cannons. His company of sixty men followed just behind him. The road was frozen and rutted. It was mid-November, 1776. Marching alongside Hamilton was his trusted officer, 35-year-old Captain Thompson, who looked on curiously as Hamilton talked out loud, practising a request to his commander. Hamilton spoke to the air. Sir, by all rights my company should move to the head of the artillery column. No. <clears throat> Sir, I formally request my company move forward. No. Towards late afternoon, Hamilton's company finally straggled into Fort Lee, named for General Charles Lee, which overlooked the Hudson River. It had been a long march that began in Westchester County, New York. Imposing 300-pound artillery commander Colonel Henry Knox, 35, former bookseller from Boston, greeted Hamilton's company with a booming voice. All right, Hamilton, have your battery position in the artillery park to the far side behind the rest of the guns. The moment that Hamilton had practised had arrived. Colonel, my company has been in the rear since North Castle. With all respect due, sir, I request that my guns move forward in the column. Unmoved, Knox replied. Request denied. Yours is an independent company, Captain, and not part of my regular artillery complement. You will march at the end of the line until I order otherwise. Hamilton frowned and continued into the fort. Sounds of booming battle drifted across the icy Hudson. Towering General George Washington, 44, uniformed in continental buff and blue, and accompanied by his body servant, 26-year-old slave, William Billy Lee, led a patrol. They were joined on the ride by two staff officers, and a disciplined, competent Rhode Islander General Nathaniel Green, 35. The party arrived at the Hudson River's edge at an overlook, pulled up their horses, and peered across at the smoke hanging over Fort Washington on Manhattan Island. My God, Fort Washington, it is under siege, Washington said, as he arched out of the saddle. On a fortified high bluff on the northern tip of Manhattan, Continental soldiers, mainly boys of sixteen and younger, and old men, stood beside a pile of their surrendered arms. Brass-helmeted Hessians and an arrogant, doe-faced British commander, twenty, on a white horse, closely guarded them. A young British drummer beat a cadence. Near the fort's flagpole, a British infantryman threw a blue and white colonial flag onto the ground and fastened a British flag to the rope and hoisted it. Nearby, American prisoners huddled. A dirty, scared fourteen-year-old American soldier with freckles and red hair 
who had been hiding behind a barrel, darted out and ran for the gate. The arrogant young British officer on horseback pulled his pistol and cocked it. Bang! The young patriot, shot in the back, fell forward dead. The officer, pistol still smoking, turned to the American prisoners. Anyone else want to try? Washington's eyes revealed deep pain as he spoke. Nearly three thousand men and arms captured. It is... it is a disaster. New York is now lost. Green, on horseback beside him, his face equally anguished, was chagrined. Sir, my earlier recommendation not to abandon the fortress, Washington, who smouldered with anger, held up his hand to stop Green. We must deal with the situation as it now stands, General Green. Begin evacuations of the Fort Lee garrison at once. General Howe will soon be at our heels. Green hastily saluted and began to turn his horse. Right away, sir. Cheers now echoed from across the river from the victorious British and Hessian troops. Washington and Green turned to see the British flag now flying atop the American fort. In Fort Lee, New Jersey, all was panic. American soldiers scrambled to form lines. Some were half-dressed and others had no shoes. A Continental officer barked out a command. All right, men, at the quick step. Forward, march! A drum beat. The drummer boy in Pfeiffer began a quick-step march. Hamilton and his company, barely having had time to rest, dragged themselves to their feet and fell in at the end of the line. The ragged American army crossed the Raritan River one week later. A cannon fired from behind them back across the river. Arching over the half-mile-wide river below, a cannonball whistled towards the fast-approaching, bare-treed opposite shoreline. Troops now discernible had begun to scramble up the slippery river bank. As the iron ball sped closer to them, the scattered blue and brown colours of Washington's retreating Continental Army were visible. Now screaming like a freight train, the cannonball was seconds from impact. Frightened young faces turned upward, shouts, screams. A young man's head disappeared as the iron ball smashed through it into the frozen earth and bounced up, slicing through ribs, arms and legs, creating deadly human shrapnel that blinded and gutted men in a surreal scene of death. Further up the line, Colonel Knox, on horseback next to his artillery, arched out of his saddle and looked back at the scattering men. Damn! he shouted. Galloping, hell-bent on his white horse towards Knox and back to the rear, was General Washington. Washington slowed as he approached Knox's position. Henry, get those damn guns turned round and ready to fire! Washington continued to gallop to the rear. General Charles Lord Cornwallis's advance guard of British light infantry, with several brass six-pounders, had arrived at the Raritan's edge. Artillerymen were furiously loading their cannons. A young British officer in his dark blue royal artillery coat with red facings commanded the guns. Just ahead of him, soldiers scrambled into small boats at the river's edge. Give fire! The British artillery officer screamed. Riding beside his infantry, motioning them forward, was General Green. Washington reached him. General, keep the boys moving forward. We need not make a stand here. Another cannonball tore into the riverbank, sending earth and human debris skyward. More men hit by hot iron fell lifeless. Others wandered in shock, shrieking in pain. Hamilton and his company, bringing up the rear, quickly unloaded his cannons from the last boat. Washington reached Hamilton's position on the bank. The now wide-eyed British commander saw Washington on his white horse at the river's edge through his telescope. He pointed, It is that General Washington just there on the shore. Give fire! The British cannon barrel erupted again, billowing white smoke and sparks. Hamilton, his back turned to General Washington, was just lowering his last cannon to the ground with his men. The British solid shot continued to slam into the river bank around them. Captain! Hamilton focused, did not hear Washington over the din. Captain Hamilton! Hamilton jumped, turned around, and hastily saluted. I have ordered General Knox to turn his guns around. He's on his way here now! Knox was red-faced and spitting mad. Soldiers rushed past him, blocking his guns. Knox frantically waved his arms. God damn it, men! Get to the side of the road! Give way! Give way! 
The artillery horses bucked and neighed as Knox tried to turn the caissons against the onrushing tide of fleeing American troops. Hamilton, you must maintain our rear guard. Set your pieces here, now, Washington bellowed. Hamilton gulped, saluted. Yes, your excellency, sir. Washington turned quickly and galloped back up the bank. Hamilton turned to his men. Ready the pieces. His right-hand man, Thompson, responded. Aye, sir. Solid shot continued to tear up Washington's soldiers further up the column. As his army quickly hurried past him, Washington lingered a moment to watch Hamilton's company in action and liked what he saw. Hamilton's men had set and loaded the artillery pieces. Thompson yelled, Loaded, sir! Hamilton coolly provided the fire command. Direct number one cannon to counter battery fire and number two cannon on the enemy boats. Yes, sir. Cannon one, range 900 yards. Cannon two, range 700 yards. Hamilton's artillerymen adjusted the cannons and aimed as Hamilton ready to engage. Ready? Give fire! Hamilton yelled. The American cannonball landed close and splashed water over the lead British boat. Hamilton's other cannon shot landed near the British artillery and mowed down several men. Watching the action, Washington realized he had to escape harm's way, so he turned his horse and rode back forward up the line. Hamilton's men, who had muskets, now levelled them at the British boats while his remaining artillerymen continued to load the cannons. Hamilton turned to his men with the muskets. Fire at will, men! Do not spare the lead! His troops rained down a withering fire on the small British boats as if shooting ducks in a pond, while British artillery continued to hammer Hamilton's side of the river. Thompson yelled, Adjusted and ready, sir! Hamilton again swung his hand down. Give fire! Blast, crack, a thousand pieces of wood splintered. A British flatboat had taken a direct hit. Other British boats started to scramble away. Cheers rose. Hamilton's men pumped triumphant fists. A victorious smile now crossed Hamilton's boyish face. Bringing up the rear had put him right in the centre of the action. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Thanks for listening. I'm Robert Child, and be with us next week for another exciting installment of Hamilton at War, only on Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.